cool. Um, <laughs> thanks to the band. <laughs> My voice is, for reasons I cannot explain, shot again this morning. And so we're all going to just do our best to stay together. <laughs> Start at the same time, end at the same time. You know the routine. Um, I'm Deb, and welcome, if you're new at Woodside, special welcome. We love visitors. They keep us on our toes. <laughs> because you can say you have the gift of hospitality, but if you don't ever have people over, who really can say for sure? <laughs> I have a magnet on my refrigerator that says, hospitality means making people feel at home, even if you wish they were. <laughs> so, we don't wish you are. We, we want you to be home here. So welcome to Woodside. Um, I do want to say there are a couple of announcements today before worship begins. Um, the day for which we have longed seem, seems to be on the horizon. Oh my God. Um, if, if everything goes according to plan this week, Dale and Joe, um, no pressure, um, then we expect to join next Sunday in our new space. From your lips to God's ears, um, this is the plan. Now, here's my suggestion to you. Take out your phone right now, if you have a smartphone, and and send a text message. The message is Woodside. Spell the normal way. That's the whole message, Woodside. And send it to this number. Ready? You aren't even paying attention to me. <laughs> No, no, this is the same one. The, the number is 31996. And if you send the word Woodside to that number, you will get text alerts from us when important, exciting things happen, like we move into a new building. Or we need help moving. <laughs> so... You can opt out anytime you want, but please don't until after we move. <laughs> and, uh, and keep up with what's going on. This could be a really um, confusing and chaotic and exciting week for us. So, welcome to Woodside and welcome to Woodside Text Alerts. Um, I, I do have one other announcement that is in its own way a celebration. Last, last week I told you that Miriam Schaefer was hoping to join us for worship next Sunday. She is our oldest member, about 12 weeks short of 102 years old, the only Woodsider who um, remembered our previous building before Court Street. Um, I saw Miriam on Thursday and she asked me what our moving date was. And I told her we expected to be in our new place a week from today. Uh, I, am, I am sorry, but, but, but relieved to tell you that Miriam died this week. She was, she was long ready to die. She had no idea why she was past 100 years old and still alive. Um, she told me some months ago that she needed to get to heaven because she had some reorganization ideas that she needed to implement. <laughs> um, Miriam was a force. Um, I only knew her, of course, in these, in these um, years of her centennial. Uh, many of you have known her since she was a younger and even more forceful presence at Woodside. Um, she has certainly been a grace to us and, um, and probably sometimes a pain in the neck too, which is what we say about all of us, you know, on our good days, on our bad days. Um, but, 
but even in my very last conversation with her on Thursday, she was asking about Woodside. She cared deeply for this church. Um, I don't know if there's going, at the moment there is no plan for any kind of memorial service. The, the family is making that decision. Her children are, were all gathering this weekend, and I just don't know. They told me that, that they imagined not, but that could change. Um, so however you would like to express your love for Miriam to the family would be appropriate, I would think. Um, and we will certainly continue to keep Paul in our prayers. Paul has been his mom's full-time caregiver for, gosh, more than a couple of decades, I think. Um, a long, long time. And, uh, and you know if you've been in that position or if you have been very involved in someone's life in that way, that when that person has died, then your life changes dramatically. So, so Paul will be reinventing Paul now. And, uh, and we are his community as well, though he has not been able to be in worship in these, in these recent years either. Um, I know that he thinks of us and, uh, and appreciates that we think of him. So we will keep Paul in our prayers this morning. And John and Mark and Mary, the other siblings, Miriam's other children. Um, Death is, um, bring, brings sorrow, brings grief, but it can also bring a particular kind of, um, of joy or, um, or relief. And, and given Miriam's desire for so long to, uh, to let this life go and, and meet her Jesus, which she was very excited to do, uh, we celebrate her life. Um, Regarding our worship this morning, uh, I have one boring announcement and one um, more interesting one. The boring one is that we try always to make our, our copyrights and credits at the end of the service as accurate as possible. And, um, and we didn't quite make it this morning. Your, the credits say that the post-communion prayer is from Anglican resources, and while we appreciate that we're able to draw from those resources from time to time, the prayer this morning is not from those resources. I wrote it, so if you, if you hate it then, or whatever, or you find it boring, or that came from me, not from our Anglican friends. <laughs> um, so there's that. I also say every week, um, especially to our visitors. We celebrate uh, the, the Holy Communion meal, the sacred meal, every week that we gather. And we understand this to be God's meal, God's grace to us. It requires no particular theology, um, no particular ID, no particular um, membership status. It only requires that you be hungry. So when we get to the place of the meal, please, if you desire, come to the table. The bread is gluten-free, the wine is alcohol-free, and, and we intend, as God intends, that it is a welcome table for all the people. So please feel free to join in. Um, I also want to say one quick word about our statement of faith this morning. In, in some seasons of the church year when life is a little less interesting than other seasons, we have in rotation in our congregation a statement of belief. Sometimes we use Woodside's particular one and sometimes we use statements of belief from a variety of sources, the Church of New Zealand or Anglican resources or uh, wherever we find um, something that seems to speak to who we are as a people of God. Um, Woodside is theologically, biblically all over the map. Um, we, and, and we find our comfort in that the believing is less important than the doing. What, what we believe is, is how, we, how we talk about God, how we talk about our place in the world, but what we do is, is what draws us together. And so the statement of faith that, that we will hear, mostly here this morning, but there are congregational um, responses, um, that statement of faith was written by me as a reflection of how I understand Woodside's faith. So I hope that you will um, glean something from it and, um, and, and feel in it a reflection of who Woodside is in these days. That's all I know that I can think of. Um, today is the celebration of Pentecost, so welcome. 
Welcome, welcome. Uh, we, we say it every week and it delights us to say so. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome at Woodside Church. So please, will you stand and join me in the call to worship? The wind blows, the clouds shift, the leaves rustle. The, God. the people tremble, the doors rattle, the earth shakes. The, the fire burns, the embers catch. The world We find our life in the Spirit of God. We are people of wind, earth, and fire. Let us pray. God of creation, blowing, burning, moving, spilling, igniting, calling in tongues of fire and wind that changes everything, you are with us. Receive our worship, O oh God. Be present among us. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, remain standing, please, and let's sing together.
women's dream dreams our women's visions our men clear their eyes with bold new decisions your people arise spirit spirit of gentleness flow through the wilderness calling and free spirit spirit of restlessness stirring the blessedness wind wind on the sea and reach the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves to keep us from being scattered over the face of the earth. Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower these mortals had built. They are a single people with a single language, Yahweh said, and this is the beginning of their undertakings. Now there will be nothing to hold too hard for them to do. Come, let us go down and baffle their language so that they can no longer understand one another. So Yahweh scattered them over the face of the earth, and they had to stop building the city. It was named Babel because Yahweh had made humans babble different languages throughout the world. It was from there that Yahweh scattered them over the whole earth. This ends the reading. A reading from Acts. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost arrived, they all met in one room. Suddenly they heard what sounded like a violent rushing wind from heaven. The noise filled the entire house in which they were sitting. Something appeared to them that seemed like tongues of fire. These separated and came to rest on the head of each one. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as she enabled them. Now there were devout people living in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven, and at this sound they all assembled. But they were bewildered to hear their native languages being spoken. They were amazed and astonished. Surely all these people speaking are Galileans. How does it happen that each of us hear these words in our native tongue. We are Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya around Cyrene, as well as visitors from Rome, all Jews or converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, too, we hear them preaching, each in our own language, about the marvels of God. They were amazed and disturbed. They asked each other, what does this mean? But others said mockingly, they've drunk too much new wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and addressed the crowd. Peoples of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, listen to what I have to say. These people are not drunk as you think. It is only nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> no, it's what Joel the prophet spoke of. In the days to come, it is our God who speaks. I will pour out my spirit on all humankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young people will see visions and your elders will dream dreams. Even on the most insignificant of my people, both women and men, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. 
and I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, and billowing smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon will become blood before the coming of the great and sublime day of our God. And all who call upon the name of our God will be saved. This ends the reading. First, I would like to say that the award for getting through the most complicated reading of the church year goes to Laura. <laughs> no one I know looks forward to this reading from Acts, and we read it not every third year in our cycle of readings, but every year, so thanks for that. And whoever may want to take it on next year, I invite you to start practicing now. <laughs> This reading must be important for us to read it every year. It's always paired with this reading from Genesis about the Tower of Babel, Babel, Babel. If one is said to be the story of how languages began, that is, God got mad at the people's arrogance and dispersed them around the world, making them unable to speak with each other, and the other story seems like a resolution to that, how the language differences were miraculously overcome, hmm. That could be. They are sometimes thought by, by some in the pairing to show that New Testament wins over Old Testament. New Testament resolves all of those icky Old Testament problems, which is so awful as to be unworthy of comment. Christians need to stop trying to win the faith sweepstakes. <laughs> Seriously. Although if you're following the Peter Paul Olympics that we've been discussing in these weeks in the readings from Acts, it is interesting to note, for me anyway, as one Bible scholar noted, that among all the nations and states of the known world that are mentioned in the story that features Peter in a lead role, there are some missing locales, namely the ones where Paul was doing missionary work. An intentional slam? We're left to wonder. But the larger mood is excitement. The people of the Jewish diaspora have all come to Jerusalem for the Festival of Weeks, a Jewish festival called Shavuot, remembering when Moses received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. It's called Shavuot, but it's also called Pentecost, the name which Christians later claimed for this, this festival that we celebrate 50 days after Easter. And it is a festival. I'm imagining food trucks and bounce houses and midway games and probably a few tables of Texas Hold'em. <laughs> Speakers blaring Boogie Wonderland, people dancing in the streets. People who rarely come to Jerusalem are gathered and probably a lot of people who have never been to Jerusalem before in their lives. So maybe not food trucks and bounce houses, but it's a big deal, it's a big day for these pilgrims. These days, I have learned, it is the underdog of Jewish festivals, called by one writer the Rodney Dangerfield of Jewish festivals, in <laughs> fact, in that it gets no respect. It is lately mostly celebrated by an all-night reading of the Torah, so less exciting, I would guess. Anyway, all these people are in town doing their, their Shavuot business, and apparently Peter and some folks are gathered in a house. They are indoors, when this violent wind came. And wind, we know, is the same word as spirit, the same word as breath, the same word as life. The wind blew, the spirit blew, the breath of God blew, life blew in. Then tongues of fire, and oh, all the languages, people speaking and hearing each in their own language. And then one of my favorite lines in all of scripture, when the cynics and the skeptics accused Peter and the others of being drunk, and Peter replied, that can't possibly be, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. As if later in the day would certainly tell a different story. But it was a festival after all, so it's probably a reasonable guess. And all of this leaves us wondering, what is the church about? 
What is the story about? Some call it the birthday of the church. Some celebrate it as the moment when the Spirit gave believers the gift of speaking in tongues, though others say it was about actual languages and not the unknown language of ecstatic praise, which is practiced among certain Christians, a gift I confess not to understand or value very much. Two of my favorite biblical scholars disagree about the story. One says the first gift of the Spirit is the gift of speech. This is LGBTQ Pride Month. And hearing this made me think of the iconic image of the late 1980s, the pink triangle, a symbol of, of the Nazi horror of massacre of, of gay people, gay men. Black triangle was for lesbians. And the words under the pink triangle on the sign, silence is death. A direct response by a protest group called ACT UP to the Reagan administration's unwillingness to talk about AIDS, even to say the word out loud, or to mention the deaths of so many, so very many gay men. The gift of speech is life-giving. Silence is death. But, says the other biblical scholar, perhaps the miracle was less about speech and more about a fresh capacity to listen. The ability to hear without phony unity, he further stipulates. Wouldn't it be better just to write them off as drunk? It's way easier than listening. <laughs> Crazy, stupid, drunk. These Jesus ideas, this weird speech, so radical that folks have to rationalize it or explain it all away. What the heck was going on here? Peter, I don't know if you've noticed this, Peter loves a good chance to preach to which I can relate. <laughs> Throughout the book of Acts, in fact, Peter is often still talking when the Spirit of God is trying to move on to the next thing. So Peter responds to the wind and the languages by preaching a lengthy sermon that begins in verse 16 and goes on to verse 36, which is 15 more verses than we read this morning. Though in all fairness, the entire thing is only about 500 words and mine so far is just over 900, and I'm not done yet. <laughs> he told them all about God's deeds of power and love. He quoted the prophet Joel, who could be a little macabre, but who also gave us these lines I love, a version of which we just sang in our opening song. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your young people will see visions, and your elderly people will dream dreams. And even though we don't ever read far enough to get to this part, the listeners then break in with a question. What should we do? Because believing is about doing more than it is about believing. And the chapter ends then, what shall we do? And then immediately a section called Life Among Believers that begins to answer the question by telling the community and telling about the community that they gathered. It says this, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. Ah, the good old days. Except, Memory is a funny thing, and good old days aren't usually as good as anybody remembers. And people continued to call them crazy, stupid, drunk, just like they had called Jesus when he first started out. Continued to think of them as dangerous, just like Jesus, like early on when they tried to throw him over a cliff, and later when they actually executed him. And eventually, Peter and James and John and many of the others, uh, and Paul, would be, would be killed, just like Jesus. Because while silence can equal death, so can speaking out. Tahar Jaoud, an Algerian poet and novelist, wrote this. Silence is death, and you, if you talk, you die. And if you remain silent, you die. 
So speak out and die. He was assassinated in the 1990s by a militant Islamic group for his political resistance. White, straight Christians don't usually face that kind of choice in these United States, but all around us, people are in danger. And the Spirit offers us the gift of speaking. And the Spirit offers us the gift of listening. Yesterday, I ran across a thread, a comment thread in Facebook, because that's what I do when I'm trying to write a sermon. <laughs> for, a particular, <laughs> for a particular Bible school curriculum published by a fairly right-wing religious group, one of the lessons in the Bible school curriculum involved having children to be, pretend to be Israelite slaves and the teacher pretend to be Egyptian slave masters so that they could all get a feeling for what slavery was like. We've heard stories like this before. Stories of people being obtuse about the reality of people all around them. So people complained to the publisher. But I was baffled, I have to tell you, I was baffled how many of them ever expected anything remotely woke from this publisher in the first place. And the publisher refused to listen, predictably doubling down on the lesson, defending the choice, but suggesting congregations might want to rewrite the parts that seem not to fit their context. Listening is a gift, and we know how rare it can be. I do think there's a connection between this story from Acts and the Tower of Babel story. In the story, the people are inspired to build a tower to heaven. They say, come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. And that right there is the problem. Let us make a name for ourselves. This story, says the scholar, is divine protest against perceived self-sufficiency and autonomy. The, the tower project is an act of hubris, entirely in conflict with the Acts community giving up their possessions for the sake of someone else and making sure all the people have food. I'm not suggesting, please, I am not suggesting that Old Testament people were bad and New Testament people were good. I'm suggesting that community is difficult to build and usually we screw it up by screwing someone else in the process of trying to get what we want. Like this. There's a news story this week that President Trump has created a trade deal with Mexico. Good for us, right? Because of all that we import. The deal is that there will be no tariffs if you all keep folks from crossing our border. Now, besides the fact that the sequence of events does not align the way Trump reports them to have aligned, here is what he claims as a win. Mexico is diverting its National Guard away from protecting the people of Mexico and away from addressing the very real problems of violence and crime in Mexico's interior and has rerouted those troops instead to its own southern border with Guatemala. This is what we are supposed to celebrate, a measure that will harm the Mexican people, harm the Central American people, and undermine the legal rights of asylum seekers in the US. We get what we want, cheaper goods, and be damned whoever gets harmed in the process. That's the kind of tower that God scattered in the Babel story, a gilded tower reaching to the heavens as a monument to self-absorption, which these days looks a lot like nationalism, looks a lot like capitalism, which d these days in the US has a name. Trump far too literally pasted on the top of towers and permanently affixed to the White House if he could arrange it. Trump, but also Bezos or Walton or Murdoch or some other, because whichever name we despise the most is merely a stand-in for the name of our country or for the names of so very many of us who default to self-interest anytime we are threatened. And by threatened, I mostly mean made to feel uncomfortable. There's pain that we can't see, pain that we refuse to see, pain that we prefer to ignore or hide 
pain below the surface, behind the faces, across the border, across the table, around the block, around the world. There is pain. I want to tell you, God, it's hot in here. I want, that was not the part. I want to tell you, <laughs> I want to tell you that today's sermon title is Eileen's fault. <laughs> when she emailed me the prayers of the people that she had written, she had each petition ending with God of earth, fire, and wind receive our prayer. My mind, my dyslexic mind, heard earth, wind, and fire, and suddenly I had Boogie Wonderland playing in my head. <laughs> then I thought, what the heck? It's a festival Sunday about a festival in Jerusalem. If there was ever a time for a dance party at church, this would be it. So we don't have a bounce house or a food truck, but at least we can dance, right? So there you go. But it strikes me that dance parties can also be masks, facades that hide other kinds of reality, like walls, if you will. Several years ago, back when I used to be a devoted fan of the television competition American Idol, there was a guy named Taylor, somebody, who was in the finals of the season. I did not think he should win, but he did win, and that's a story for another day. But his song choice in that finals episode was the classic by the Doobie Brothers, Taking It to the Streets, which he performed as if it were a dance party, like a street fair, and the crowd joined in the revelry and everybody had a really great time. They were laughing and singing and dancing like they didn't have a care in the world. And I just sat there with my palm to my forehead, <laughs> complaining, not so under my breath, that that's not what the song is about. And just to prove it, though they weren't really listening to me, I looked up the lyrics, which go like this. You don't know me, but I'm your brother. I was raised here in this living hell. You don't know my kind in your world. Take this message to my brother. You will find him everywhere, wherever people live together, tied in poverty's despair. And the refrain, you keep telling me the things you're going to do for me. I ain't blind, and I don't like what I see. We're taking it to the streets. This is a protest song. It's only a naive dance party song if you aren't paying attention or if you don't mind fiddling while Rome burns. And then there's Boogie Wonderland. Most of us only remember the first word, dance. <laughs> And the chorus, Boogie Wonderland. But the lyrics, <laughs> the lyrics are way more than that. Midnight creeps so slowly into hearts of men who need more than they get. Daylight deals a bad hand to a woman who has laid too many bets. The mirror stares you in the face and says, baby, uh-uh, it don't work. You say your prayers, though you don't care. You dance and shake the hurt. The people gathering in Jerusalem for a festival were living in occupied territory, still under threat of violence, perhaps with snipers on every rooftop, still longing for self-determination. Maybe they were living such a hell and hoping to forget for just a minute. Maybe underneath most dance parties there's a bunch of pain we can't see, or maybe we're all too aware of the pain and dance parties are our drug of choice. We dance to shake the hurt. And that escapism can lead us down a bad road of addiction and self-medication individually or as a nation or as a church as we try to numb the reality. There's so much to hope for, so much to mourn, so much to regret or resent, so much to reconsider. And maybe it would help to ask what an acts community would look like these days people speaking and listening in a way they had not before, sharing and hearing, bearing each other's burdens as if they were our own, which they often are, putting aside the desires that separate us and just falling into the arms of love for all creation. Imagine all the people 
living life in peace. Maybe then it would look peaceful and free. Maybe instead of imagining reform of our prisons, such a vision of the world might look like the end of prisons altogether. Maybe instead of our insufficient white guilt that accomplishes very little, we might find racial reconciliation and reparations for those whose families' futures were stolen for the sake of wealthy ownership classes to the ongoing benefit, the ongoing benefit of white people. Maybe instead of demeaning programs that make people prove they deserve to have food and shelter, we might decide to end poverty by a universal basic income, a guarantee of sustenance and dignity to every single person. Or maybe we could imagine a guaranteed wage that actually meets the requirements of daily living. Maybe we could imagine a world where the environment is seen as a living thing, God's first creation deserving of our love and care, or a life where animals live in peaceable kingdom rather than the terror of what we dispassionately call concentrated animal feeding operations where their bodies are relentlessly raped and plundered. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Or you may say I'm crazy. Or you may wonder if I'm drunk. And let's not dismiss that possibility. (laughs) (laughs) I'm reading a book right now called Underground Church. And I may be asking the board to read it with me prior to our fall retreat. Robin Myers writes this in a chapter called Sweet Jesus. He says, it is best not to try to do theology without a poet in the room. We need poets. We need people with imagination. Otherwise, he says, we end up in meaningless disputes like, should baptism be by dunking or by sprinkling or by dry cleaning? (laughs) While the world crumbles around us. The spirit brings gifts of speaking and listening, and it seems like we need to do a great deal more of each. Speaking truth when the crazed dance party tries to drown it out, saying out loud that there is a megalomaniac in the White House and genocide in Sudan and an epidemic of murders of trans women of color and a misogynistic movement that is terrifying and a virus of nationalism that is sweeping the nations and threatening world stability and a disregard for the planet that is nearing the point of no return. Speaking truth, but also turning down the music to listen when truth is spoken to us. The truth of people of color who tell us what life is like in this country really and it didn't just get this bad because white people suddenly noticed. People of color who over the generations have gathered in juke joints and fiestas to dance and pretend for just a minute that life outside the door isn't a death dealing mess. The truth of refugees who are not making up stories of danger back home just so they can steal our jobs and take over our country. The truth of scientists who really do know what the hell they're talking about. The truth of lesbian, gay, bi, and and trans and gender queer folk who tell us that life is not binary and people can't be all that easily categorized. The truth that creation is way more rich and beautiful and way more fragile than we've lately been willing to admit. Speaking without fear. Listening without interrupting or contradicting. And then we become better neighbors, better leaders, better world inhabitants, better dreamers, better poets, perhaps even better dancers. Then we don't need the self-medication, the masks that hide the truth or hide the pain. The wind blows and crowd forms community. Maybe this story never really did happen. It seems kind of far-fetched to me. Maybe it was the memory of folks who had a vision and words were inadequate and this was the best way they could find to express the amazing thing they had experienced. For 50 days now, we've been pondering resurrection and what it means and we have leaned heavily on metaphor and vision and stories and here we are at Pentecost, a day celebrating earth, wind, and fire. The song, Boogie Wonderland, actually ends the first verse with these words. All the love in the world can't be gone. All the need to be loved can't be wrong. But Joel said, Peter said, God said, 
I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy and your young people will see visions and your old people will dream dreams. And I wonder if in the midst of our own boogie wonderland, maybe we just couldn't listen more carefully to the lyrics and dedicate ourselves to that kind of dreaming. A regular reflection on creation as we're told it began, an act of love from a creator, and then asking ourselves what is possible. Spirit blows, life, when the breath of God and the dance party goes on and we are invited into a world such as we have never seen before. Amen. Please join me in the statement of faith. We are the children of God. We might believe God created the world and all that is in it in a few days. Or maybe we believe it was created in an instant. This God continues to create, to shape a world. This God continues to create, to shape us. This is a God of world transformation. We adore God and we gather in adoration. We are followers of Jesus. We may treasure the stories told about Jesus, born of a virgin and raised from the dead, miracle worker, crowd feeder, authority challenger. Or we may cherish the lessons and stories he told, parables and what-ifs that help us glimpse the reign of God, Jesus born in obscurity, alive with something sacred, and dead by the hands of the state. We might believe Jesus was God with us, divine and righteous. Or we believe he was a rabbi, wise and a little bit crazy, with, the, with divine out of the mainstream notions of what life could be. We believe Jesus was the truth. We believe Jesus told the truth. Even when we cannot decide what to believe about Jesus, we follow Jesus. We are the people of spirit. We are born of the universe, born into a world of love and beauty. We might call it born again, or we might call it born anew. Whichever we awake every day in a world that needs us. A people that has forgotten how to love. We experience the gifts of the spirit in a variety of ways. Some gifts that make sense and some that really don't. We live in this spirit. By this spirit, the very breath of God, we live. Inspired to see a new way. Imbued with power for a new day. We give, give thanks, thanks for the spirit, spirit of God. God. Our beliefs may be all over the place. But our mission is God's passionate love. Love that changes everything. This is our statement of faith. Spirit of God, we beckon you to whoosh through our lives, to unsettle us, to call us, to meet our deepest spiritual needs. Help us find the strength and courage to serve this broken world. Together, let us call upon the one who hears us and can satisfy every longing, saying, God of earth, wind, and fire, receive our prayer. For the church scattered throughout the world that the bread and wine of the shared communion meal would become an elixir to our souls, awakening the church to its greatest purpose, 
Help us to rise against injustice, to become acquainted with and work to relive, relieve the suffering of others, and to love, accept, and embrace everyone as they are created to be. For those in power, please expose leaders who care only about lining their pocketbooks or serving their own agendas and rise up leaders who will act in the interest of others and be committed to the common good. God of earth, wind, and fire, receive our prayer. For the people of Flint, that you would continue to brighten its darkened corners. Bless all those who seek to make this a better place for its citizens, so that the narrative may be changed to one of hope, courage, faith, and resilience. God of earth, wind, and fire, receive our prayer. For our neighbors, both new and old, that they would know Woodside as a place filled with people desiring to agitate for the well-being of others. Help us to invite them alongside us in the journey so that we might know them, love them, and together become a stronger force for good in the community. God of earth, wind, and fire, receive our prayer. For all those connected to this church who are wrestling with life's challenges. Brian Rose, Adam Jester, Mark Cody and the Cody family, Leanne Lindsay, Chuck Crum, Robin Rosario, Harvey Crow, Bonnie Gable, Penny Meyer, the Shaker family. Bill and Gloria, Dorothy, Lindy, Michelle, and Andrew, Karen, Catherine, Evelyn, Linda, Kathy, Mark, Betty, Tyler and Lita, Doug, Earl, Cliff, Jason, Jean, Laura, Sandra, Dot, Alex, Jenny, Don and Liz, Harry, Greg, John, Melissa, John, Ashley, John, Jamie, Gabriel, Myron. We ask you to pour out your spirit of help, healing, and attention. Thank you, O oh God, for receiving our prayers, even those that are unspoken or hidden deep in our hearts. May your spirit refresh us and be as evident and awe-inspiring as a rainbow after the storm. Amen. Awash in the Spirit of God, we are attentive to the beauty and brokenness all around and determined to do what we can. Let us offer our gifts to God. Let's stand and sing together. As the grains of wheat was scattered on the hill, were gathered into one to become our bread, so may all your people from all the ends of earth be gathered into one in you. As this cup of blessing is shared within our midst, May we share the presence of your love. As the grains of wheat was scattered on the hill, were gathered into one to become our bread. So may all your people from all the ends of earth be gathered into one in you. Let this be a foretaste of all that is to come. 
when all creation shares this feast with you. As the grains of wheat, once scattered on the hill, were gathered into one to become our bread, so may all your people from all the ends of earth be gathered into one in you. As your spirit moves and you continue to breathe life, inspire us, O oh God. Receive our gifts, bless our intentions, and use us in life-giving ways. Amen. God is most evident with us in the spirit of Jesus that guides our days. 50 days after the festival of resurrection, but only 53 days after that awful night when we were unsure we would ever see Jesus alive again, we continue to experience all that is new in the realm of God. We see visions and dream dreams. We hear voices of ancient and modern prophets. We tell over and over again the stories of creation, the stories of Jesus, and we are assured that our faith is not in vain. This particular story we tell for power and truth, a story that never gets old. It is the story of Jesus, just before he would be arrested and executed, having dinner with his friends. Meals were so very important to him, an ethos of hospitality, a commitment to food, and we can imagine the din of conversation at the table. It was perhaps a sacred meal from the start. We know that people of various faiths all around the world share in sacred feasts. Our Muslim friends have celebrated Eid al-Fitr this week, a celebration of life at the end of a period of daily fasting and nightly meal sharing. Some eat to remember, some to garner strength, some as an act of worship, perhaps all three. For us, this is our story. That night at dinner, when Jesus was inspired to make a promise, he took bread, blessed broke it and gave it to everyone gathered. He said, this is my body, about to be broken like this bread, broken in search of a new way. Eat and remember. Then he poured a cup of wine, passed it around and invited them all to drink. He said, this cup is my blood shed, my promise that the vision will come to be. Drink and remember. The story we tell we people of Jesus tell us of a meal that will not end, the foretaste of a feast to come, when all people will have what's needed, when all creation will be honored and blessed. That's the day for which we long, the day for which we dream. This meal then is part dream, but also part living the dream, when we gather in all our diversity to share what is good. This is a moment of being in the realm of God. This is good. We eat and drink in hope, and in love, let us pray. Pour out your spirit, O God, on this meal of bread and wine. Let it, let us, be part of your vision, part of your desire for a world made new. Bless us, and let us be a blessing to others. Amen. Now, come and eat. The meal is ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Please stand and pray with me. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your spirit poured out in bread and wine. By this meal, yet let your spirit accompany us through our days. Let us bring strength for the journey, comfort for the difficult times. Oh, for a world of peace. Amen. God bless us and keep us. God's face shine on us and be gracious to us. God look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Amen.